Thank you for coming. Um, it's a little bit um, uh, frightening to talk about creativity to a group like this. Uh, but when I was approached to use our space, I said, sure. And they said, would you be the speaker? And that was months ago. And I'll agree to almost anything if it's two or three months ahead. <laughs> but then it's here, and it's like, what do I now do? So the topic of space, you can't help. Um, but to start, because uh, you could take this any number of directions. But as an architect, um, obviously, uh, spaces for people, uh, urban spaces, is where I've spent most of my career. Uh, as human beings, we consider and think about space in lots of different ways. Obviously, there's intimate space. That's me. Uh, intimate space, which is a very small circle around us. There is. Um, uh, social space, there's obviously uh, personal space, and there's group space. And so we perceive space on various different levels. And because all of us were given the same tools in which to um, think about space, use space, our five senses, we share those, and therefore we start at the same place when we start thinking about space. Architects, we have a palette of things that we can use for space. Scale, density, light, rhythm, the whole host of those. But our approach here at Clearscapes really adds some others that I think, for us at least, create space in more meaningful ways. And those include time, the whole notion of how humans over a period of years uh, have impacted on spaces. And you can see their presence. You can see their fingertips, uh, their footprints on spaces. Uh, we also deal with the notion of interactivity. Uh, spaces only, are, only work when you engage them physically. Uh, it's not a pas passive approach that we take. You want to engage them actively. And then finally, the whole notion of storytelling. Um, if we can tell stories in our spaces, in our buildings that we create and the art that we make, it really gives us a way to connect more deeply with other human beings and say something about our aspirations. So I'm going to use some of our work to talk about those notions of, of time, of interactivity, and storytelling, give you some examples of ones that we've done elsewhere, and we're going to end up talking about the Union Station simply because that's where all of our effort is being put at the present time. So I grew up here. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee. A river city, <clears throat> uh, and obviously had a whole host of bridges, which is all about connectivity. How do you get from one side of the river to the other? Um, and the one in the foreground was built pre-Civil War, um, 19th century bridge, quite famous, quite beautiful. When I lived there back in the 60s, they were going to tear it down. Fortunately, they didn't do that, and it's now this wonderful pedestrian uh, connection on the Greenway. So we did a piece led by my partner, Thomas Ayer, that was all about connectivity and all about interactivity and all about storytelling. <clears throat> so this is uh, downtown Chattanooga. Um, because the city is in transition, uh, reconnecting different neighborhoods in the city is incredibly important. And so this was an intersection of art and exercise, believe it or not. <clears throat> That's a giant uh, exercise track around with the usual stations that you find when you go out and exercise in public spaces. And what we did was create this piece, you see the three of them there, that really harkened back to the stories of connectivity of the original bridges across the Tennessee River in a way that have some direct connection, but also allow, while you're exercising, <coughs> to actually turn those trussels and have a direct impact on the spaces that you occupy. It was fairly heavy, so you got to work pretty hard, part of your workout, to move those things. But you can have an impact. You can change the space. 
You don't have to be there passively. You can leave your impact, and obviously the next person is going to leave their impact as well. And it's not only exercising your body. Um, Thomas uh, worked with some haiku poetry, and you can exercise your mind as you go around this track. And so it's a way for human beings to really have an impact on their environment, to leave their mark, and to learn about the stories of a river city. The next piece I want to talk about is obviously right down the street where you've had Creative Mornings many times in the past and will again in the future, the Contemporary Art Museum. The reason I want to put this one up, it's really a conversation about time, about old and new, about the warehouse district and the industrial heritage of this part of town and contemporary art. And one might think those are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So we have a historic warehouse. It's a contributing building to a National Register Historic District, which means there's all kinds of things you can and can't do with it if you want to qualify for the financial incentives that the state and the federal government provide for reuse in historic buildings. But obviously, it's not a warehouse anymore. It's an art museum. And so the ability to put something, uh, engage that building, a cross-century conversation, a cross-cultural conversation between history and present, between industrial notions and art, it's a real opportunity to tell stories. And what was a real enjoyment for us was the building had such great bones. And so even on the inside, how do you start to expose the artifacts, the the skeleton of our industrial past, and yet do it with some very contemporary detailing. So there's these conversations that are going on. You want to do it quietly, because what's important in this case is not the building, it's the art. The building should not compete with the art. But I don't think the building has to be passive. I think it can engage in a similar conversation that the artists who um, create and display their work engage the same viewer. So the building has an active role in that. And the use of artifacts. Obviously, this old freight elevator was just a cool thing. And to leave it in place and let it tell some of the stories, let it unfold and unveil part of the history of that building, um, we think adds to the character of that space. And of course, since we are in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we all enjoy those southern front porches, Obviously, we had to create a front porch facing the downtown, a gathering space, and kind of pronouncing itself to the city. This next project is in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, this is probably the most hallowed ground in that state capital, this large urban space that you see there. This is where Nashville was founded. Two North Carolinians, as a matter of fact, uh, got off their canoe in the Cumberland River, which is right below, kind of climbed up a steep bank soaking wet and decided Nashville should be here. And ever since then, this has been an important public space. You can see the major uh, city government and judicial facilities are here, state governments up on the hill. For quite a number of decades, this really important space was a surface parking lot. It's amazing how we <coughs> treat at times some of our most important spaces in our communities. But finally, they got uh, um, the funding and the idea to bury that parking lot. Uh, the thing about this bluff on the Tennessee River, it's solid rock. So they drilled down five or six layers below with parking to get all that stuff off the street, created this important public space. And so what we did was to create two columnar pieces. Obviously, that space is used heavily. The Country Hall of Fame uses that and gets tens of thousands of people in it. So the art couldn't get in the way. At the same time, the art wants to say something about a place. So this piece called Citizen, again, allows the public to interact with it, another giant wheel at the bottom, and that human figure, male on one side, female on the other, allows the citizens to kind of point the direction of where they want their city to go. So here we have folks deciding, now we want to go this way. <coughs> and the two figures have a conversation back and forth. One here, one there. And it really starts to define 
the whole notion of, of citizen participation in their own communities, in their own government, and the ability to impact individually on those major public spaces. Not be a passive participant, but be an active one. It's really a great space when you get 10,000 people playing country music in there at the same time. <coughs> okay, a little closer to home, uh, Saxaba Hall. Uh, how many have been in Saxaba Hall? Ah, oh, I wouldn't be surprised with this crowd. Uh, sometimes I say that and nobody's ever heard of Saxaba Hall. Very unique, small community, west of Chapel Hill, south of Burlington. Um, one of the most creative, most diverse communities I've ever experienced. Uh, paper hand puppets has their headquarters there. They've had an event for quite a number of years called Saturdays in Saxaba Hall, where they celebrate music and art and crafts and food. And they have a giant hill where they put a piece of plastic down on a hose and the kids use it as a water slide. I mean, it's just a great community. We had the opportunity to work with a diverse group of clients. Um, the son of the original mill owner, the Jordan family. Now, this was the Jordan Mill. Um, a construction uh, crane company executive, uh, a couple who are some great foodies, um, and another couple, one of which is a former NBA UNC Chapel Hill basketball player. Um, probably as diverse a group of people as you can imagine. They wanted to continue investing in making community in Saxball. So there are two mills. One is down the hill, and it's the beautiful one dripping with character as we think about masonry mills. That's the image we always have, and they renovated that years ago. This is the one they gave us. <clears throat> Not quite as um, uh, appealing as a starting point, uh, but it allowed us to intervene in it in more serious ways than maybe we did at CAM, where the building had to be treated with great respect. So these are kind of in progress. The project's not done. It's been going on for years, and we've got a few more to go. Um, this is the way the mill works now, and we really help them come up with a mix of uses that really start to create community. Restaurants, uh, gathering spaces, both indoors and outdoors, living spaces. So there's a great restaurant called the Eddie there now. If I go back one, with some really killer views on their deck of the Hall River. Great place to hang out, see your neighbors, and drive from the Triangle to, to enjoy as well. Uh, this was the Dye House. Um, what's somewhat notorious about this part of the mill is back when we did things like this, um, these were the large dye vats um, that they would dye socks, blue, red, green. And then everyone downstream knew what color the socks were that day because the Hall River became the same color. Fortunately, we don't behave that way anymore. But that's part of the heritage of this place, that kind of industrial past, the way we treated our environment, sometimes not very sensitively. So we took those vats, and we decided to celebrate uh, some of that history. Uh, so that's one of the dye vats, which is now the sign for the Hall River Ballroom. Um, really a wonderful gathering space. And because they'd been gathering on that hill outside every Saturday in the summer, we created essentially an indoor hill with layers on it, becomes a great music venue, a great place for events, parties, weddings, you name it. But tried very hard to allow the character of that space, its history, to still come through in ways that people can understand and feel differently than if we were to build a new building. We created another uh, venue. This was the coal pit, literally. And now <coughs> we cleaned it up a bit so brides can wear their white dresses without getting coal dust all over them. And folks can sit out there in tuxedos. And then because of the environmental past being somewhat checkered, um, this is one of the most sustainable buildings now in the Triangle. Um, obviously, we recycled the building, which is an incredibly important, sustainable act. It's all heated and cooled by a whole series of geothermal wells. We collect all the storm waters. We kind of celebrate how <clears throat> the water used to be used coming out of the vats. 
and they now all go into a bioswale. They're cleaned before it's let into the Hall River. So it's a little conversation of what we used to do, what we do now, in ways that are not unlike each other. Same vat, same pouring it into the river, but in a way that is a little more environmentally appropriate. That was what one of the buildings looked like. We're just finishing it now. Spaces in between that really people want to be in and living units with some amazing views of the Hall River. Now, last one. Um, all that is by way of introducing how we're thinking about this project, which affects all of us in this room. Um, the Union Station, we hope to create not only a good transportation center, but a building that also provides the next great civic spaces for our capital city, both indoors and outdoors. A building that can be authentic, memorable, and unique, which is what it should be. Train stations in our past were the front door of our communities, the threshold coming into a city. And we all know vividly the wonderful historic stations all over this country, starting with Grand Central in New York, and the list goes on and on and on. Raleigh's always had more modest stations because we were a more modest community. But we think there's an opportunity to create a station that is unique to this creative place. And that's what we're trying to do with the viaduct building. It's a really great mid-century industrial building. Again, the outside, not that attractive, um, but essentially an industrial cathedral on the inside. What a great space. And part of our job is quite honestly, not to screw it up. It's a great building, and we need to celebrate what's good about it. Architects at times don't know when to stop, and so we're trying to be careful of not making the building uh, less good than it is today. But at the same time, allow it to tell stories, allow it to be interactive, um, and allow it to really talk about time. What's really nice is we have a great place to start are kind of our industrial heritage of this part of Raleigh. Raleigh obviously wasn't an industrial city. We don't have the really great acres of industrial facilities. We only have a few, which makes them more precious. And so there's a whole series of things we can learn of how necessary to be necessary. It's kind of the bywords of any industrial plant. They didn't do things for looks. They did it because it had to work. And so we're trying to pick up on that innate beauty and use that in this place. Plus, there's a great tradition of railroad structures, the old railroad sheds. I mean, some of the greatest spaces, most of which are now gone, um, that we've ever had in this country. There's also a really great tradition of the railroad structures that they use for their signals. Um, really elegant, beautiful structures. And the one on the far left is called a semaphore. It had arms at different levels that would tell the train proceed, slow down, move to another track. Critical, especially when you start hearing all the train wrecks we've had in this world recently. And then the whole other uh, issue is connectivity. Um, it's tough for two trains to cross. And so these wonderful patterns, these railroad diamonds, was a technology that was developed in the 19th century. And so that, that, that X shape, that diamond, is something that we feel we can celebrate throughout this building. So um, that's where we're heading. Um, this is Cam right there. That's Martin Street. That's West Street. That's the um, gallery that's in that location. Um, but what we want to talk about was creating great public spaces. And so one of our challenges is the viaduct building is inside the Raleigh Y. That's three active freight lines that form a triangle, which means we need to get 10,000 people a day onto an island that's surrounded by sharks, because you cannot legally cross an active freight line. We do it now because it's there, but you can't do it anymore. So the real challenge is we've got to move the front door, at least conceptually, move that front door back to the city. So this large canopy element is our current thinking on that. If you remember this semaphore you saw, this uh, kind of harkens back to that kind of structure. Part of it is protecting you from the rain as you walk down. Part of it is to provide some shade from the sun. 
because being outdoors is wonderful, but in late July, sometimes it's not quite as fun as it is in October. And so this great public space is what we're trying to create, using that canopy to help define the space, to activate the buildings surrounding us, and have it work at a number of different scales. Two people having a cup of coffee in the morning, or uh, 1,200 people, up to 2,000 people for a hopscotch concert when they're in town. <clears throat> Coming off the platform, it's all about introducing people to the city, the space that we call our community. So you get off the building, you come around to the Viaduct building, which will be transformed with similar shade canopies that can tell stories. As you get off the concourse, we're being very thoughtful on how we frame views. You want to introduce people to our capital city in ways that you've planned. And so that kind of first view you get from Raleigh as you come off the concourse, there's our skyline, which obviously will continue to change. But it's kind of the first view you will get as a passenger arriving in Raleigh. And then entering the cathedral, they were trying to have very careful interventions to celebrate what's there but not take away from what's important. Obviously, you need some retail. You've got to buy a cup of coffee in the New York Times when you're getting on the train. Uh, we're adding second-level spaces with overlooks so you can engage. And then up on the top level, a new mezzanine that we think will be a very attractive place for food service. I'm thinking about retiring and open up one of the hottest bars in Raleigh up there <laughs> because it's going to have killer views back into the space. It opens up up to the roof, and so there'll be a roof terrace looking to some green space to the north. And most importantly, that's the view from that mezzanine back to downtown Raleigh. That lower part of the canopy lines up with Martin Street, trying to reestablish that important connection to the William Christmas plan that we joy, enjoy here in Raleigh, that planned city that we have. Obviously, looking down into a civic space so from that restaurant, outdoor views to public spaces, indoor views back into a civic space that's not only a train station waiting room, but it'll be an event center that all of us can enjoy. So that's where we are today. Uh, I wanted to try to explain how we think about space, and it's all the usual ways, as I said, to start with. Scale, materiality, rhythm, light, density, those are all the tools of the designer. But we think time, interactivity, and storytelling is a way for spaces to do more than simply keep you comfortable and keep the rain off your head and give you enough light to, to uh, plug in your laptop. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. Uh, started in 1981? Yes. If you got the same job in 1981, would you attack it differently than you do today? If I got it in 19, well, first of all, I wouldn't have gotten it in 1981. <laughs> but let's just say somehow it, it fell from heaven. Um, to be candid, yes, I would approach it radically differently because in 1981, as a 30-year-old uh, young architect, um, I had not had the opportunity to hone my skills and to experience the things that I've learned along the way. And my best learning, to be quite candid, hasn't been uh, uh, necessarily what I was taught or what I've experienced, but I'm really fortunate to have a team of creative people at Clearscapes that are, to be quite honest, a whole lot better than I am. And so being able to attract uh, bright people uh, into it and work as a collaboration and 30 years, most of what I do now, besides helping with the design, not leading the design, but helping, is trying to figure out ways for these projects to happen. I mean, we're dealing with three railroad companies, and most of you know, some of you may not, we gave this country away to the railroad companies in the 1850s. We said, if you'll build us a railroad, we'll give you the country. And we did. And so now, when you want something back from the railroad, they have only one answer. Nah. 
And so I've got three railroads surrounding me. And so a lot of what I'm doing with the NCDOT is trying to find common ground, trying to find ways to accomplish what we're talking about. It's a different skill set. And yeah, at 30, I had no clue how to do any of those things. So experience and no hair helps after a while. <laughs> Other questions? Steve, often in the work of Peer Stage, there is a, what we call an artistic component that deals with the history, the legacy, the wisdom of a local area. How would you characterize that for this project? Um, good question. Uh, as most of you know, Thomas Sayre, uh, my partner, uh, who also gave one of these uh, Creative Morning Talks some time back, has been my collaborator since we started in 1981. And the ability to integrate art, sometimes it's a capital A, people want art. Other times we have to call it an integrated architectural element. Because art can be a four letter word you don't use in public in some places. <laughs> There's all kinds of politics behind that. And so uh, part of what we're doing now, Frank, is that whole notion of those solar screens, both in the civic space and on the building itself. Some of you may have seen earlier, there's some drops sitting over there, steel plates. They're drops from another project where we cut things out with a water jet. And we literally brought them over here and stacked them together because there may be an idea there of how to layer different ways of screening the sun and through those shadows and through that backlighting at night, a whole nother understanding, a whole nother story level starts to come out. So those are some of the early things we're just starting to think about. To this point, it's been mostly planning, trying to get people heading in the same direction. Now comes the fun part of really starting to hone those stories. But good question. Thank you. Other comments? In the back. Now that we've seen your vision for this space, talking about the frustrations of budget constraints and how you keep your optimism off and go forward. Um, yes, absolutely. Because every public project that we get involved in has budget challenges. I've never had a project in my career where they said, you got all the money you need. <laughs> uh, and this was no, no different. Uh, the very uh, public debate about the state taking back 15 million, digress for just a second, the project never had the 15. There was a promise, the 15 was in another project as contingency. And if they didn't need it, they would give it to this project. Well, they needed it, so it could never come over. So that, pro the, the, that 15 million wasn't taken back. It was hopefully, maybe, in best case scenario, you'll get some of it, and we're not getting any of it. That being said, the city and the state are working very closely to secure the funding. I've been in few projects that there wasn't a higher level of commitment to make this project happen. We got $21 million from the federal government in a Tiger IV grant. We've got another application in their Tiger V program to try to get some more. We'll find out in a couple of months whether we're successful. So while we don't have the money in our pocket today, all that we need, I'm as optimistic as I've ever been that those funds are going to be secured because this project, I really think, is the next great project for our community. Uh, not just because of the train station, but what it'll do for this neighborhood, what it'll do for kind of our creative image in, in the country. Um, uh, so yeah, stay tuned. We're not there yet. We do have a hat at the front door if you want to drop some money in. <laughs> we will collect that, put it in the project. Hey, Steve, continuing on that thought, there have been some reports in the media that there may be, this may be accomplished in stages or there may be a scaled back version that comes first because of these budget issues. Is that, is that a true story? And uh, if it is, uh, yes, how do you no. see that? Um, because we got federal money in the Tiger IV, we have to prove to them if we get nothing else, what could we build? And so we've had to go through the exercise of looking at the money we have today, and the money we have today is $36 million, about half of what we need. If that's all we had, worst case scenario, what could we do? So we've had to go and figure out, all right, trains have got to back up. <laughs> You've got to get off the train into some type of waiting room. Um, and so we're going through those exercises. Could that happen? Of course it could. Worst case scenarios are always possible. I don't think it will. <clears throat> I think there's going to be the funding we need 
Uh, we may not build everything we want in one phase, but I have fairly high confidence that we will have adequate funding to do whatever is the, the initial effort that is meaningful and not in a good enough for Raleigh attitude <coughs> that we've suffered from in this community sometimes in the past. Um, it's half past 2013. Um, trains will park at that platform uh, sometime in 2016. So I've got a little bit of time. That may sound like a long time in my world. That's next week. Um, uh, so it's an aggressive schedule, but we do have some time to work with the city and, and the state and the federal government uh, to see if we can find other sources of funds. Other questions? Yes. How do you deal you know, with criticism you might get from the public about your buildings? Because you're in public space and you love to bring up things about what they like and what they don't like. Um, when you choose to be an architect, you're obviously putting stuff out there. And if you choose to engage uh, the public work that we do, obviously you're going to have people offer their points of view. Um, now on the convention center, um, we hosted over 100 public meetings, literally. I stopped counting when we hit 100. I said, Bam. <clears throat> but if you engage the public, if they are invited in and critique your uh, approaches, talk about your goals, and we then treat them honestly and say, you can't have everything. Help us with those trade-offs. What's more important? On this project already, we've had three major public meetings. We've had seven stakeholder meetings, and we'll have a bunch more. And so while there's always the opportunity for people not to be satisfied, I think if you engage them in a very open way and have them struggle, and it's a struggle, but what's more important? Do I spend that 10 cents here or do I spend it over there? Because it always ends up being funding related. The one thing I don't do is read the blogs because the mortars from across the wall with no one identifying who they are those are just hard to deal with. Um, I, I, when I see those, I, I try to get my staff to say, invite them to the next public meeting. Let's have a real conversation. But the kind of you're not anonymous, it's horrible, you don't know what you're doing, it's hard to engage that in, a, in an intelligent conversation. So we get, we get plenty of those, too. Can you talk a little bit about your, um, you wrote the question, what does your space say about you? Maybe for an architect, it's like a personal question. But what kind of space you like to surround yourself with and create and home or office or places you could? Well, um, obviously you're sitting in one. If, if any of you want it, we're in. My office is next door. Um, on that side is our design office. On this side is our art studio. My wife and I, who, yeah, she got tired of listening to me. She left. Uh, <laughs> she's working. Uh, we live in a loft apartment on the other side, and so, uh, no, I'm not trying not to answer your question, but I think for you to see the spaces would probably tell you more about how I personally think about space and what I like to surround myself with. Um, it's, it's very different. If you go to different architects' offices, you will get a very different feeling of their goals, their culture. We think ours is a pretty good indication of how we think and what's important to us. Not everyone likes it. Not everyone thinks it's the right direction. That's the wonderful thing of what we do. There's no shortage of opinions. Yeah, I find that I live in, I work in an architecture firm, and, but I kind of allow myself to live in a little bit of a crummy apartment, you know? And uh, it's really funny the things that I kind of work on every day, um, trying to create really big spaces that I let myself be in like this, like low lit, you know, windows, old furniture, you know, a lot of hallways and doors, and those are the things that I try not to, Recreate every day. But that's where you want it's to funny that, yeah, no, you, You've got a lifetime quest in front of you. Yeah. That personal I environment is going to change I, I, I allow myself to kind of be one way and try and keep it. Keep, keep, keep doing it. <clears throat> My wife and I have an ongoing conversation. <clears throat> um, I'm more of a minimal, minimalist in my own environments, and she's more of a um, stuff person. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tape that? I'm in trouble. Uh, 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 so uh, many of her friends who are more into things than she is see our home as being cold. 
I see it as being clean and uncluttered. So, you know, it depends on which words <laughs> one selects. Anybody else? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah. In, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, so many historic or older buildings were either covered up or torn down. Why do you think, I mean, I know there's probably several reasons, but what are your feelings on why spaces like this one and others are, are so valued now? I mean, I think it's a good trend. What do you think is this leading that back? It's a really good question. Um, there's a kind of an old saying that we hate what our parents built and we love what our grandparents built. <laughs> and so we go through these stages, right? <clears throat> um, uh, back in the uh, 60s, 50s and 60s, uh, Oakwood, that wonderful rich Victorian neighborhood, we were planning on building a highway through Oakwood because those are ugly buildings. Who would want those? Um, now it's obviously one of the nicest neighborhoods in downtown Raleigh. And so we, we go through that. We have to, right now it's kind of the 50s and 60s buildings. We all look at it and say, God, that's ugly. Let's get rid of it. Um, but you wait another couple of decades, <coughs> and people are going to say, why did you tear down that building? And so we've been doing that for generations. Um, I think we're getting a little bit smarter about understanding that phenomenon and are doing less of wiping the slate clean. Part of what is really good about sustainability is we've learned the embodied energy in a building makes it more sustainable than a lead platinum building's ever going to be. And so as we look at a world of scarce resources, recycling what we've got, just like the compost uh, trash can over there, is obviously more important. So we're, we're learning. Same time, yeah, we're taking steps back in other areas, and we won't talk politics today. <laughs> other comments? Well, you've been a very, oh, sorry. You and Thomas have been partners for 30 years, and, and I think you bring different strengths to the partnership, but can you talk about that long-lasting relationship and how that, maybe how your process together works since you, since you do bring two different things together and how you've made it work for 30 years? I'll have my view. Thomas, I'm sure, has, has a slightly different one. Um, any partnership is really no different than any good marriage. Um, uh, it's wonderful. It's challenging. I love that man. I hate him at times. Uh, a couple years, well, now 15 years ago, um, we decided our own personal office would be in the same room. We stay private offices. We have to make appointments to you know, talk to each other. Now we sit in the same space. I overhear his conversations. He overhears mine. We say, you know, give me five minutes of looking over my shoulder. And so we're, we're continuing to find ways to make that relationship work. Um, we think very differently, and at times that is a huge advantage. At other times, it's frustrating because both of us are convinced we're right, the other one's wrong. Uh, does that sound familiar for all you folks who have partners in life? Um, uh, I think what has sustained it, in my view, is that we share very similar goals and values. Uh, the work that we do, we're passionate about. We think we're making a difference. And I know I am convinced that I would be less effective and have fewer opportunities if Thomas Sayre wasn't sitting at my side uh, helping get there. Uh, so it, it's challenging, but it's rewarding. And it's so much more rewarding than challenging that it's continued for 30, almost 33 years now. You want to? Rebuttal that? All right, well, that's a question. Thank you. Thank you, folks.